Hi, everyone. It's here, no. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'm Catherine Horgan, and I'm the Programs and Partnerships Coordinator at the Rhode Island Historical Society. And um, we're really happy to have you guys here at Inside the Archives, our second installment of our series. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Sarah Carr, who is the Director of Advancement in Public Engagement at the Rhode Island Historical Society, and she's going to get things started for us. So Sarah, take it away. Hi, good evening, everyone. We're so happy to have you join us, as Catherine just said, for our second Inside the Archive program of the year. Um, I just wanted to have a few quick notes for everybody. If you can please try to keep yourselves muted during the program. Um, we are recording. If you don't wish to be recorded on video, just turn off your video um, and we won't have any images of you recorded. We'll do our Q&A at the end. Um, you will be welcome to raise your hands if you wish to ask your question aloud. Or if you prefer, you can always put a comment or question in the chat and Catherine will ask all of your questions to Gabe um, at the end of the call. Um, and just a few other quick housekeeping notes. Um, in addition to this program, we have um, another program coming up in just a few weeks, our next Drink in the History program with White Dog, um, which is a rum distillery, where we'll also be welcoming, we'll be doing a tasting of rum and moonshine at White Dog in Pawtucket. And we'll be um, complementing that with a talk about uh, a distiller from Snowtown, Eliza Granger, who will be sharing her story. And then we also have our next Inside the Archive program coming up in March, in which Ray McKenna will be talking to us about the work he's been doing to transcribe all of our Old Stone Bank records and the stories that he's discovered about immigration um, at the turn of the century in Rhode Island by being able to uncover the stories of individuals using those records. Um, and I'll also say Ray was very excited about this evening's program because he saw a real connection between the work he does to uncover those micro histories and the work that Gabe has done. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce this evening's speaker. Um, Gabriel Lorcono is an associate professor of history at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. As a graduate student at Brandeis University, he was surprised to learn about poor relief in early America. That story brought him to the Rhode Island Historical Society more times than he could count. With the help of several archivists there, he learned how to find and interpret old records. His recently published book, how Welfare Worked in the Early United States, Five Micro Histories, is based in good part on that research. And please help and join, it, join me in welcoming Gabriel. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and thanks to everyone who's come uh, this evening. It's, um, I'm so happy to see you. And you know, there's a, a lot going on, a, a lot of distressing news in the world. Um, but I'm really pleased to spend this hour with you uh, thinking about history and about archives, and also to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Rhode Island Historical Society this year um, with, uh, with, with an appreciation of all that they have done over the past couple of centuries and, and made possible um, our better understanding of the past. Uh, so thank you all. So, um, do you, Catherine, do you want to go ahead or should I? Yeah, great. So I'm just going to queue up your presentation that we have here. So everybody give me a thumbs up when you can see my shared screen, because we all know Zoom can be a little, a little quirky sometimes. So can everybody see this? Thumbs up. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. There. Thank you. All right. Does this look good to you, Gabe? Yes, that looks good. Perfect. And just let me know and I can transition through the slides for you. All right. Well, um, I just wanted us to focus a little bit with um, with Misha the Squirrel of the Rhode Island Historical Society there uh, next to a cover of my book. I also have a giant cover that I brought into the camera view just for this occasion um, to say a little bit about how the Rhode Island Historical Society helped me to write this book. I've been visiting uh, for a long time. And since I moved to Wisconsin in 2009, I've been able to visit, but also had uh, wonderful help from far, um, uh, librarians, archivists at the at the society have, in my opinion, gone above and beyond in um, in looking for things for me, uh, answering questions, and um, and sometimes sending digitized copies of things for me to uh, be able to track down leads. Um, because uh, what I've tried to do in this book is to tell five good stories about people. Uh, who 
either received poor relief, what we today colloquially call welfare, what they uh, called poor relief 200 years ago, um, or uh, who administered poor relief. Um, there's been some wonderful work done on the history of poor relief um, and, and on social welfare history more broadly, uh, including by some of the people who are here tonight and who have told um, uh, great stories. And I wanted to make a contribution to that work and try to tell a few good stories about people um, so that we could understand how this worked. Uh, and the Rhode Island Historical Society made that possible without, without the work of archivists over the last um, few years and, um, and, and, uh, and several decades um, and, and 200 years, ultimately, uh, this wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. So um, I think what I could do, um, Catherine, if you could go to the next slide, is talk a little bit about how I found these records and then um, uh, a little bit about these five stories and how they're connected to the, the archives. So I, uh, in preparation for this talk, I found my very first dissertation notebook, um, which I think was from 2003, 2004, and I'm not uh, just saying this because this is a Rhode Island Historical Society talk, I opened it up and the very first thing was this piece of paper, which you might be able to make out in the upper left hand corner with the name and address of the Rhode Island Historical Society Library, um, now called the Mary Elizabeth Robinson Research Center. Uh, so I went there pretty early on, as many, you know, uh, junior historians do just floundering looking for anything about the history of poor relief, anything about the history of poverty, as I was doing research for my dissertation. And um, I found lots of documents, um, uh, which, you know, generally became part of, of my dissertation. Um, and one of them is pictured here, you can see it's a list of names. And the very first name is of a man named uh, Cuff Roberts. Um, uh, it also makes reference to his wife and four children. And um, over time, I understood what this list meant. It was a, a, a list of people, all of whom were of African uh, descent, uh, that the overseer of the poor was asking the town council to banish, to warn out uh, of, of the town of Providence. And it took me quite a while to figure out um, the full context here. And um, it wasn't until years after I had finished my dissertation and was thinking about a way to try to tell this story, um, uh, to tell a story of, of poor relief, that I came back to this document that I had come across at, at the Rhode Island Historical Society and thought I should look for this guy, look a little harder for Cuff Roberts and see if there's anything else. Um, because for years, all I knew about him was that he was one of the first people banished uh, in this um, uh, kind of explicitly discriminatory um, uh, banishment in 1806. Um, and so I, I did come back and, and that's essentially what I did with all the five people is I found their names by happenstance, trying to understand how poor relief worked and, and um, what poverty was like 200 years ago. And, um, uh, and then as I kept scratching, and, uh, and often with the help of archivists past and present, I found out more. Let me say too that at, at any point, I'm happy to answer questions and, and Catherine, please break in uh, whenever you want me to go in a different direction. Um, but what I could do right now, if you could go to the next slide is talk a little bit about each of these five people and uh, who they are and, and then pause for, for questions. So, in the end, I decided to focus on, on, on these people who I thought all had good stories to, that I could tell. And um, the first one is called is named William Larned. He was an overseer of the poor for a really long time. Um, and that meant that he was in charge of how the town of Providence raised uh, taxes to spend on poor relief. Uh, um, he, you know, really how, how much he and his fellow overseers charged was how was basically how much the town had to raise in taxes um, every year. Uh, his his expenditures would be the vast majority of the town tax expenditures for a given year, 
uh, in the early 1800s. By 1830, roads and schools caught up to be about the same uh, cost as, as poor relief. Uh, but he was, you know, in, in, in a very powerful man. And I've often thought about how people in Providence would respond to him compared to George Washington, who was president when William Larned first became an overseer of the poor. And I would argue that William Larned is way more powerful, that he, uh, uh, that he affects people's lives a lot more than any national or even state uh, political figure. One of the people that he was instrumental in banishing is the subject of chapter two. Uh, Larned and, and Roberts were both part of the Continental Army during the American Revolution um, and, and both moved to Providence from much smaller towns. Uh, but Larned was allowed to stay and, and not really challenged in his um, uh, uh, membership in the community of Providence. Roberts was banished repeatedly uh, legally, the poor laws allowed this kind of banishment, um, though, as I mentioned, it's pretty clear uh, that that, that uh, power was being applied in a discriminatory way um, by town officials, including William Larned um, in the early 18, 1800s. Chapter three is, um, was the hardest chapter to write for me. It's about a woman called Sarah, known as One-Eyed Sarah, and she worked for William Larned. Um, so part of the reason I decided to stick with five figures all from Rhode Island is that I could connect them to each other um, and I, I could uh, compare their experiences to each other all within similar circumstances, the same state and, and similar laws without uh, changing things too much. Um, as you can see, if you read the book, I make an argument that, that we can learn a lot about the broader American story uh, from these five Rhode Island stories. Uh, but Sarah, um, I, well, ultimately, I never figured out exactly who Sarah is. I could, I could tell part of her story for a part of her life, um, but I was never fully convinced that I had found the right Sarah, though ultimately, I found two Sarahs, um, both of whom matched her experience in, in interesting ways and from both of whom we could learn a lot. Uh, chapter four takes us to Situate, um, you know, down a few country roads from, from Providence uh, to a, um, a woman named Lydia Bates. And um, uh, her experience uh, was someone who from, from childhood was uh, taken care of by overseers of the poor. But the way they did it was they essentially put her up in one farmer's house after another, and she worked in exchange for food and uh, room and board. Um, and, uh, and that kind of worked, it seemed, for everybody uh, until uh, she was, became pregnant. And at that point, this was sort of a crisis in the situation uh, from everyone's point of view. And what the overseers of the poor do next allowed me to, to see into Lydia Bates's life a little bit because what they did next is they, um, they essentially launched a paternity suit against a, a guy named Thomas T. Hill. And Thomas T. Hill fought the suit and together um, the town and Hill generated so many records that we get a, a rare glimpse into the life of a young, um, unmarried mother who, who is in need of poor relief. And so that's what chapter four is about. And finally, um, William Fales uh, lived in Portsmouth at the beginning of his life and the end of his life. Uh, he lived a lot of other places in between. Um, he was born the same year as um, Lydia Bates's daughter named Rhoda. Uh, William Fales was exactly the same age, um, but he, uh, as, a, as a boy, suffered from um, a, a sort of mysterious uh, ailment um, that we could call a, a form of rheumatism. And it's that that, that brought him back to, his, uh, back to this town, Portsmouth, and, and into the poorhouse. And so from his experience, we can understand a little bit about what the poorhouse is like. Any questions or things we should talk about before we look more closely at some of the archives. So a few questions and then a comment. Um, this is a comment just thinking about, you know, Rhode Island and its history is, 
you mentioned how Cuff Roberts was it was you know banished from Rhode Island it kind of brings to mind Anne Hutchinson who was also a famous Rhode Islander who was banished from Rhode Island and I feel like there's this thread throughout history of people being banished from Rhode Island so I feel like that's something that is always at the front of our minds whenever we talk about these stories is there's you know banishments happening so that's just more of <laughs> off the front of my brain is you know that historic connection how that is just you know, very present in a lot of our records of different historic figures throughout the state. Um, did you find a lot of that? Did you find a lot of banishments, you know, as a way of just getting people out of the state as a way of, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's a great question, Catherine. And let's move forward to the Cuff Roberts slides. And I can say a little bit more about his experience um, and, ba and banishment uh, more generally. Um, so I think one, one more, Two, uh, two more after this. Yeah, there, we um, go. <laughs> there we go. So, so what I call banishment, what legally is called warning out um, in this period is really, really common. Um, so where Anne Hutchinson is originally banished from Boston, at least uh, because of her, her religious views, essentially, um, what becomes really common is for local officials to warn out anyone uh, who is not settled in their in their town uh, that they don't want there. Usually the reasons are because they're worried that this person might need poor relief. But um, in the case of Cuff Roberts, I think it's pretty clear that, that he and his family do not need poor relief. They're, they're fine, um, but, uh, but the poor law and, and banishment in particular can be used, can be kind of twisted um, and used in a discriminatory way. Um, there's another great book that came out a couple years ago called Vagrants and Vagabonds um, by Kristin O'Brassel Colfin. And she shows how, how many people in the mid-Atlantic states are being banished all the time. And it, it, you know, we think of America after the revolution as a very free place. And in some ways, there are lots of freedoms enjoyed by early Americans. But freedom of movement is not, not necessarily one of them. Um, the, the, uh, the poor laws in pretty much every state uh, give local officials a lot of power to knock people out of town. Um, and that happens to Roberts repeatedly. Roberts wants very much to live in Providence. And I, I think this is for family reasons and also to be a part of a, a larger community of people of African um, uh, and, and uh, Narragansett descent. Um, but the overseers and the town council keep saying no. And um, they don't banish him from the state of Rhode Island. They banish him to his hometown of Coventry. and. Um, uh, and yet he keeps coming back anyway. And, and in the end, he, he kind of prevails. Um, ultimately, as a Revolutionary War veteran, he's entitled to um, uh, a pension in 1818, which is dispersed in Providence. And um, amazingly to me, the town officials are still hassling him, you know, uh, 20 years after his initial banishment. Uh, but he gets the town officials to agree that they have to let him come uh, to pick up his pension. I find it interesting that like he, in some ways he's accepted by the national government but not uh, by the local government of Providence. And I included this watercolor painting because I think um, many of you may recognize it. It's a picture that we see a lot in connection to the revolution. And the man on the left of course is, is a, a man in the uniform of the Rhode Island Regiment. And I've never seen this man identified he absolutely fits the physical description of Cuff Roberts. So I really wonder, like, is, is this Cuff Roberts? There's, there's a, probably about a hundred other men that would also have been at the Battle of Yorktown and, and met this description like Roberts, but you know, that could be him. Wow, that's very interesting. So another question that we have is, you mentioned that a few of these stories overlap. Do you find that in your research, there's through lines with all of these stories being in Rhode Island around similar times? You know, are you having overlaps of certain things? Is this something that's common when you're looking into, you know, research of one person that you start to find the story of another? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. One story does often lead to another. Um, I, I am 
certain that of these five people, four of them were alive at the foundation of the Rhode Island Historical Society in 1822, and probably all five. I can't be totally sure about uh, Sarah, but um, but the, the others certainly were living. And um, Cuff Roberts knew William Larned, um, uh, One-Eyed Sarah knew William Larned. Um, the others probably don't know each other, though they have some overlapping experiences. But um, the, and the chances that Cuff Roberts knew One-Eyed Sarah, I think, are quite likely. Um, uh, but uh, I haven't been able to prove it yet. Um, and I find that it does make for you know a better story when you can connect, when you can connect to other events that your readers may have heard of, and you can connect one story to the other. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting just seeing the overlap with all these because, you know, it is a small state, so people yeah. now run into each other very easily. Um, you had mentioned that specifically in your research for One-Eyed Sarah, you had thought it might have been two individuals at one point. How can you tell the difference? Is it in, you know, the handwriting of these documents or is it in the style that they're, they're you know, speaking? How do you differentiate and figure that out? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if we go forward a couple of slides, I think we'll have um, some uh, examples of documents about uh, One-Eyed Sarah. Um, one more slide, I think. Right, okay. Um, so in the case of, of One-Eyed Sarah, um, uh, I know that the Rhode Island Historical Society is really involved in digitizing newspapers, um, right? And yeah. uh, and so it's it's because of digitized newspapers that I found her story in the first place. Um, I was doing word searches in digitized uh, versions of of Rhode Island newspapers for words like poor and pauper, and I found this argument uh, amongst people kind of fighting in the newspapers during the summer of 1811. And I was really intrigued, um, and you can see in the lower right-hand corner, um, uh, one of these articles, I was intrigued by this reference to a woman named One-Eyed Sarah, who, um, as you can see here, um, I, uh, the writer, and I'm pretty sure the writers are the overseers of the poor in this case, um, they describe her as a, quote, Indian woman, uh, quote, formerly of respectable character. And um, it turns out that she's a, a nurse who, who actually is giving people full-time health care at the expense of the town of Providence Treasury and and succeeding, right? Bringing them back to health. And what intrigued me about this is that, you know, I, I don't know about all of you, but my initial understanding of how the poor law worked is flavored by Charles Dickens novels, you know, like Oliver Twist, please, sir, may I have some more? And you think of it as just about as bad as you can imagine. Um, but I, I actually think that in some ways it could be quite good um, and, and quite generous. And I think that One-Eyed Sarah's work is an example of that. Um, instead of providing you know, minimal comfort to, to poor people who were dying, uh, the town actually pitched in for full-time nursing care and she clearly did the job, right? She, she gave care that brought people um, back to to health from difficult situations. Um, I think a situation not fit to be mentioned in this article, it, you know, it's clearly a euphemism. For what I can't prove a, a strong candidate is, is syphilis, um, but, uh, but this is hard work uh, that Sarah does and is paid to do by the town. So I really wanted to tell her story. Um, and I thought finding an indigenous woman uh, named Sarah, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. I really tried hard. I consulted the Rhode Island Historical Society's um, People of Color database, which had helped me find more details about Cuff Roberts's life. And there were some Sarahs in that database that could have been uh, her. I also consulted this index. Um, that was created almost a century ago uh, during the New Deal, the Works Progress Administration um, sort of ca card index to the Providence Town Papers to see who was paid uh, by the overseers. And there were numerous Sarahs in there. And so that helped me to narrow down who it might be. 
Ultimately, though, I couldn't decide if it was more likely to be Sarah Hill, uh, who's described um, in, the, in an entry of the town council minutes on the upper left-hand corner here, or Sarah Olney, a woman who's repeatedly paid um, at about the time that one eyed Sarah is working uh, for nursing and other things. Um, so I decided to tell both of their stories in the chapter uh, because both of their stories really help us to understand um, uh, what one eyed Sarah's experience might have been. Yeah. And on this slide, I also included um, an article from the Rhode Island Historical Society's magazine, and it's by Ruth Wallace Herndon, who I think is here. Hello, Ruth. Um, a 1992 article about town clerks and how, um, how to use the minutes that town clerks left. And if you notice, this page in the upper left-hand corner is really nicely written. You, you probably can't read it, but the, um, the, uh, the handwriting is nice. There's no crossouts. Um, the clerk wrote something and then asked Sarah Hill to make her X, uh, which you can see. And um, uh, if we go back a slide or two, um, we, so uh, we can see a different uh, town council. One more slide, we can see a different entry. So um, this is an entry about Cuff Roberts. And um, this, this is the draft version of the town council minutes. And it took me a few readings of Ruth's article about town clerks to really understand this, really get it through my thick skull, skull what was going on here. But if you notice the difference, there's lots of scratch outs, lots of mistakes um, in this draft version. And it's the draft version that's held by the Rhode Island Historical Society. And the nice smooth version that we saw in the previous slide is held um, at the Providence City Hall archives. And, uh, and, and this, this draft version really helped me to learn more about Cuff Roberts um, and to understand you know, how, trustworthy the story is in the town council minutes and what some errors might be. Um, and in particular, this with all the scratch outs, there's clearly some misunderstanding about who Cuff Roberts's children are and what their names are. And, and so that it, it was really helpful to be able to see the, the draft version at the Rhode Island Historical Society. Hmm. So if you didn't have that you know, more clean record to look at? How would you go about deciphering these documents? And, you know, how would you pull details from that to create a story or, you know, a through line for all of these stories? Where do you start when you have a document like this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, realistically, I could have written Cuff Roberts' story with either the draft version or the polished version, but, you know, I, I think a lot about how how true our history is and how we can know it's true. Um, and I think it's uh, my my story is truer to have both these sources. Um, that makes for a richer, better, um, slightly more accurate story. I still can't know everything, right? I still don't know who who one eyed Sarah is for sure. Um, but the more the more we keep these documents and the more we compare them one to another the better our history gets, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's such a great point you make about, you know, maybe we have a messier document, a handwritten document, but then how do we find something in, you know, a town record that can kind of back that information up and, you know, not just going on, a, you know, a single person's written record of what they experienced of how we can find documents to back all of that up. So could you walk us through that process a little bit, you know, with looking through different archives, looking through our archives, you know, what are the documents you're really focusing on finding when you're doing this research? Is it journal entries? Is it town hall records? Is it, you know, what's, I guess the question is, if somebody's going into this for the first time, what would you recommend they look for? What's the style of document they should start with? That's, that's a really good question. And I have to say, it took me years of frustration in, you know, sort of banging my head against the wall. Like, why, why is there no document to answer my question? Um, I remember my first paper in graduate school, I ultimately couldn't answer the question I was asking because there just weren't, there weren't um, uh, 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 documents, evidence that could really answer it. Um, you know, I, I don't, maybe someone else knows a better way, but I don't know of a better way than to just dive in 
and start reading these, um, take notes, see what jumps out at you. And I think it's just going to take time. Um, I, I was so inefficient and, you know, just not wise about primary source documents when I started, but I don't know how else I could have gotten better at it without, you know, my many visits uh, to the research center and, um, and just trying again and looking again and, and getting better at, um, at handwriting. Uh, I noticed in the, in the chat, um, uh, Wynn said uh, that it's hard to read cursive writing and, and that's absolutely true. And um, uh, I, I know that my wife, Andrea, who also teaches history, um, uh, hi Andrea, uh, and I, we both, we both bring students to the archives and, um, and they can't, they just cannot make out cursive at all. Uh, and and uh, and I, I, in one funny instance, a history major in our archives here at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, um, uh, he he was you know looking at a at a piece of paper. Uh, the archivist had said, you know, if some some of you may have documents not in English, let me know if you do. And he raised his hand and he said, I'm pretty sure this isn't in English. It was. It was just that the cursive was so so difficult for him to read that he thought this must be another language. Um, but I got better at that. I, I think I'm pretty good at making out the scrawl of 19th century clerks now, uh, just by dint of doing it a, a lot. And and so I I would recommend just dive in there and practice it, do it. It's it's gonna it's gonna become a lot easier. It yeah. was sometimes literally a headache at first, and now I, I I love looking at this stuff. Yeah. So a little bit of trial and error, you know, just practicing, getting used to the way that people write, and then over time you just become more comfortable with deciphering these things it, it seems like um, yes yeah and, and I agree um, uh, with uh, with what Tracy said in the chat that the the process is a huge part of the whole thing just mm. there's no way around it but it's it's a good thing yeah it feels like that's how you almost get connected to these stories and that's how you can write so much about them is you you know through all this work you're spending so much time in a sense with these people because you're reading all these documents about them you kind of get connected to it, um, which I think ties into the next piece a little bit is we'd love for you to kind of dive into some of these individual stories that you researched and, you know, the things that you found with them. Um, if you have some favorites or some that you spent a little bit more time on, we'd love to be able to highlight those. Um, so if there's any that you'd like to start with, we'd love to, you know, hear more about that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I would, and and I uh, I'm I'm seeing the chat too, and one of my parents wrote the name of my third grade teacher in the chat, which I think must be a reference to the fact that I have horrible handwriting. I failed handwriting in the third grade, like I actually got an F in the subject, and perhaps that makes me um, a bit more uh, empathetic with some of the clerks that don't have good handwriting. That said, when when a new clerk was elected who has better handwriting, and you're reading. Um, uh, uh, that, you know, straight through, it, it's such a relief to read the, the, the clerk with better handwriting. But we have here some, um, some documents. Uh, a couple of these are, are documents that while I was stuck in Wisconsin, unable to really go to Rhode Island for research, um, Jennifer Galpern and, and her colleagues found for me uh, in the Rhode Island, Island Historical Society and these document Cuff Roberts' time in the Continental Army. He was in it for, I think, more than five years, just a, a, an unusually long term. And um, it was not entirely clear at first what, whether he had ever been enslaved in Rhode Island um, or not. And what Jennifer found were two lists here. And one is a list of Rhode Island Regiment soldiers who were enslaved when they enlisted. And the other is a list of Rhode Island Regiment soldiers who were free at the time they enlisted. Because um, as some of you may know, uh, the first Rhode Island Regiment was sort of reorganized in 1778 as a, a regiment that would accept um, uh, enslaved men as soldiers with their uh, uh, slaveholders permission um, uh, and in return for compensation, uh, but it never really met the targets, the, the recruitment targets, and so it, it accepted a lot of people. Um, anyway, long story short, Cuff Roberts' name is on both lists, so 
like here's a case of primary sources in direct contradiction of, uh, with each other. And I, um, I was really grateful to Jennifer for finding these and ultimately had to like figure out, well, which is more likely to be true. Um, and Cuff Roberts had an amazing story of, you know, twists and turns and a lot of his uh, time in the revolution, we can trace, we can find um, and, and uh, with documents like this. And going back a couple documents, uh, another example of um, of someone who who you know kind of changed in my head as I read more. Catherine, if you could go back one or two slides, sure. Um, one, uh, this one. So William Larned is the overseer of the poor in Providence from the 1790s until he dies in office in the 1820s. It's a really really long career, and from early on in, in, my, in my dissertation research, long before I kind of re, re, rethought things for, for my book, I saw his name all the time. He, he was the overseer of the poor of Providence. He was everywhere. Um, if you go back one, one more slide, I think, or two more slides, you can see an example of his signature. Uh, you can see it there, W. Larned or W. Larned OP. It's just everywhere. It's all over these records. But if we could return, Catherine, um, two slides ahead again, um, I kind of, you know, I really didn't like William Larned. I kept coming up to uh, against his name in connection with people like Cuff Roberts being banished, and I, I kept thinking, well, what what an ogre this guy is. Um, and then at the Rhode Island Historical Society, I I stumbled upon the papers of his son. So his son actually does have a small collection of papers. Um, and there were a couple letters from William Larned to his son. And all I had seen of William Larned were um, official documents, government documents. And um, and it was, you know, it was it was really a little bit emotional for me in the archives to see this other side of him. Uh, whereas you can see in the in the part that I've made large here, uh, he's essentially talking about how how much he wants to see his son, his son who is living in Spain at the time. He's been far away for years, and how much Larned says he misses his son, um, and that he's getting old, which is true. Uh, and it allowed me to see another side of William Larned that I think was really important um, to be able to write his story and what what he's up to and what his, his uh, goals are. Um, so that's, those are two of the stories. Um, William Larned is this long-term overseer of the poor. And while on the one hand, he banishes a lot of people, on the other hand, he, um, he also helps a lot of people. Uh, he does use his powers as overseer of the poor to save people from health crises and uh, from hunger. Uh, from homelessness. And I, I, I thought that as much as we sometimes criticize poor relief and welfare, that it's important to remember how helpful it was too, and how expensive it was, and how much people were trying to make it work, and in many cases did, did make it work. It's, you know, it's interesting when you talk about how you know, at the start of your research with um, William, you said, you know, he was an ogre almost to you. He, he came off as, you know, a bad person. And then as you got to find more documents, you know, written to his son, you kind of changed your opinion. How, when you're writing these stories and these narratives, do you almost in a way suppress your own personal biases towards these stories? Are you trying to just tell the facts? Are you trying to, you know, maybe fill in some gaps with your own thoughts? How do you separate the two in this research? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, and and I think ultimately you can't totally um, take take your own feelings thoughts out of the history that you write. On the other hand, I think as historians we have an obligation to get things as right as possible, as true as possible. Um, so I, I think it's a I think it's a struggle every historian has that you know we we really need to. There's a story that's in our heads before we go to the archives, and you know sometimes we we want to find that document, that smoking gun that's going to prove us right. But you also have to have your mind open uh, to what you actually see in these documents. And um, I don't know how others do it, but um, I read a really good article 
uh, many years ago by the historian Jill Lepore. And the, uh, t the title of the article was Historians Who Love Too Much. And it was all about doing this kind of history, micro history and biography. Um, and I think her specific example was that in some archives, she found a little um, snippet of hair um, from, I think it was from uh, Webster of, of the dictionary fame. And, um, and she, you know, she had an emotional reaction to this man's hair in, in her hands. And, uh, and so I, I don't know that you can ever totally um, get, get around that, but I do think that, it, you know, we have to be conscious of those, um, th those our, our own perspective and what we wanted to see um, and, and, you know, really try hard to let the archives lead us to, to the truest story that we can get to. Mm. So in a way you're using, you know, almost both sides of the story, you're having his more professional documents, but then also his personal letters, and you can kind of put those two together to get the full picture, which I think is a great thing that you do. You can really round out these stories. Um, you had mentioned earlier that there was, it seemed like a story of almost child support where there was a single mother and her relationship with a man um, who she was trying to, in a sense, collect child support from. Uh, I was wondering if you could dive into that a little bit more and tell us some details about your findings. Absolutely. Yeah, let's, um, let's go ahead to uh, the chapter four slides on, on Lydia Bates. Okay. Um, now, this, this is a case where um, I was at another archives, the Rhode Island Supreme Judicial Court Records Center, and I walked in uh, not really knowing what I was looking for. And the archivist, uh, just uh, Andrew Smith, um, he, he, he gave me this giant file of papers and I hadn't asked for it, um, but he thought I might be interested in it. And it turned out to be all the papers um, uh, related to this Supreme Court, Rhode Island Supreme Court case um, about uh, the paternity of this little girl, uh, Rhoda, um, whose mom is Lydia Bates. And uh, Lydia Bates repeatedly said that Thomas T. Hill is, is Rhoda's father. And he fought this um, uh, three times, at least three times in the Rhode Island State Supreme Court and generated all this paper. And it was um, a windfall for me as a young historian. I, you know, I, I just saw into the life of a young uh, woman receiving poor relief in a way that is really, really hard to do. And so I, 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 I really appreciate Andrew Smith. And in fact, later on, he found more records um, and, uh, and sent me copies of them for which I'm, I'm really appreciative. And it allowed me to understand a, a, a story from someone who is receiving poor relief from their point of view better than I think any other records I had ever seen. Um, it taught these depositions talk a lot about her life, what her life was like. And um, the one that I've uh, put on this slide on the on my left hand side is the first one where Lydia Bates's voice really breaks through. Um, most of the depositions are other people talking about her. A few of them are her answering yes or no uh, to the questions of the justices of the peace. Um, this one is the first one where um, you can you can almost hear her suddenly just you know bursting out with uh, with a story to the to the clerk writing these answers down, um, and this is as close as we can get to her voice because as you can see um, she too uh, is not able to write her own name and so she writes her mark um, at the bottom there. Mm, it's so interesting. So with women's stories specifically, how has in your research, how have you found these voices? Because often they're not reflected, you know, through our historic documents. Um, how do you get more details about these women's lives? Is it through, you know, these court documents? Is it through, you know, men in their lives? What's been your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, the the thing is, I I mean, we, I wouldn't have known probably anything about Lydia Bates if Thomas T. Hill had not taken. Um, the, the town overseers to court three times. Um, so, you know, over time, I, you know, in, this, in the same way that I kind of resented some of the things Larna did, I, I also, and I didn't like Hill either uh, um, because he, 
uh, he, he really tried to ruin Bates's reputation in these depositions. Um, but without him trying to do that, how would I know this story? Um, and, you know, long story short, she grew up in a really poor family. Um, from the time she was a child, she was living in different people's houses um, in return for their work. And, um, uh, uh, and then um, she's working in someone's house and, um, uh, and, and then she becomes uh, pregnant. And uh, then the overseers suddenly need to find more money for her because up until that point, they hadn't really paid for her upkeep at all. Uh, so now, now they need to pay for her and they do what the law demands actually, which is to identify the father and force him to pay. Um, she identifies Thomas T. Hill. Thomas T. Hill refuses to pay. They send the sergeant to arrest him and, and bring him from Providence back to Situate. Um, uh, and and he, uh, he's pretty well connected. One of his brothers is an attorney. And, um, and so he takes this case to court a lot. Um, and Sylvia asks, what does Lydia say? Read the document. Um, and uh, if you give me a second, I can find a, a really readable version of that, I think. Um, so Bates, Lydia Bates had, had remained kind of quiet um, throughout most of the depositions um, and didn't have a lot to say except consistently saying it's Thomas T. Hill. Um, and then uh, the, um, I think the justice of the peace asks her in this particular 1821 deposition, did Mr. Hill in the month of September um, offer to carry you to, towards Boston uh, to live until after the trial of this case? And then in the single longest answer she ever gives, um, she says, yes. And Mr. Hill offered to marry me if I would go and live within the town. Uh, with, uh, uh, see, let me start over again. Um, yes, and Mr. Hill offered to marry me if I would go and live where the town of Situate could not find me until after the trial and would support the child. He told me he had no reason to dispute the child being his, but meant to plague the town of Situate. I was unwilling to go to court a year ago when requested by Mr. Henry because said Hill advised me not to go and said he would settle with the town of Situate. Um, so it is the longest story that you ever hear um, kind of coming out of, of Lydia Bates's um, uh, mouth and, and really does, you know, kind of add to the drama of what happens here. Um, so Hill fights this case for years while the town um, gives Lydia Bates support to take care of little Rhoda. And, um, and she does that and uh, Hill keeps fighting, but ultimately the town wins their cases and Hill is forced to pay. But by the time Rhoda is about seven years old, the town does what towns typically did at this time, which is to separate children from, um, from uh, uh, mothers and fathers who didn't have much money. Um, and this is, I think, one of the more heartbreaking parts of, of this, uh, of the stories here, um, is that that was their, that was what they wanted to do. That was sort of general policy. Um, and so as far as I can tell, they do separate Rhoda uh, from her mother. And at that point, Lydia Bates has disappeared for me, for, for my, per I, I cannot find her after about 1827, when her daughter is seven. There is a, a strong likelihood that her daughter married uh, one of the boys who lived in the house that took her in ultimately um, and uh, and has several children, uh, um, some of whom fight for the Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, so the story continues, but um, but I, I wish that I, I knew more about Lydia Bates's story um, after she's in her 20s. Wow. Well, thank you for researching this. It's so important to hear both sides of these narratives and, you know, be able to give this woman a voice when otherwise she wouldn't have been and to be able to highlight her story. You know, it sometimes can be frustrating to just have these documents pushed down and not brought out to be fully told. And, you know, we never would have heard this important piece of this whole trial is that, you know, this man said, you come live with me, come marry me. So it's, it can be frustrating when you look back at these things and you're like, oh my gosh, to think that this, 
might never have been said and people would have never known. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing this research. Um, I think another thing, you know, thinking about all of these concepts that you talk about in your work, they're very modern day concepts as well. And you're talking about a lot of them through the lens of, you know, historic stories. How are you breathing life back into these? How are you connecting people back to these, you know, historic records of people's lives? What's your process when you, when you're doing this? Yeah, um, well, my hope, I mean, I, I, I got into history probably in high school because I had some great teachers who were really good storytellers. And I, I've thought about that a lot, that what brought me to this field was stories. And so um, I want to tell good stories. I'm trying hard to write good stories. In some ways, I, I think I want to borrow some of the, um, the skills of, of a novelist while telling true stories uh, based on, on this evidence here. And so I hope I've succeeded in part. Um, I took a great course in graduate school with um, the historian Jane Kamensky about writing uh, uh, narrative style history. And, um, uh, and so, you know, I, I'm sure I have to work at it more, but I start with a timeline of what all the documents tell me happened um, and then try to uh, think of a hook uh, to start every chapter. And, um, and then essentially just tell a short, good biography um, from there. You've done a wonderful job because all these stories are so compelling, every single one of them. You just wanna dive into these people's lives and learn everything about them. So I think you've made some you know, hard topics to talk about a lot more accessible to people in a way that you, know, you feel like you can connect back with them and you relate to these stories. Um, it looks like we do have a question in the chat here. Let me see if I could pull it up. I also noticed that, you, so we're getting a little bit closer to our um, 8 p.m. end time. So if it's okay with you, I'd love to be able to, you know, end our slideshow and then open up a more yeah. open forum of questioning, if that's all right with you. Absolutely, yeah. And thank you, Sylvia, for your comment. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess, you know, if anybody has any questions about the things we've talked about today um, with Gabe, feel free to put it in the chat so that we can answer it now or forever hold your peace. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, just so we can talk about them a bit more. So I think a question that I have because I'm selfish and I have you here and I want to be able to ask you a million questions is what was a story or a narrative that stood out to you the most that really struck you while you were doing this research? Was there one person or story in particular that really resonated with you? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, they, they all do. Uh, to some degree. Um, I even came to have some appreciation for William Larned uh, in the end. And um, I, I, one that we haven't talked about so much is William Fails, uh, the last chapter and the youngest of all the people profiled here. Um, and his, his story really did, it, it did hit me. Um, essentially, the one big source that tells his story is an autobiography that he wrote um, uh, essentially by, by pencil while he was almost completely paralyzed and in a poorhouse in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Um, and just like his spirit, his like hope, his willingness to keep fighting in, in, the, in, in the face of, you know, pretty awful circumstances, um, I found pretty inspiring. Mm. Wow, that is a wonderful story. We have um, a question here from Tracy Picard. Hi, Tracy. She's actually going to be at our White Dog Distilling event on March 10th. She's going to be speaking about Snowtown. So shout out to you, Tracy. Thank you for being with us. Um, Tracy said, did you learn anything about burial and free grounds in your research? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I wish I could go to that event. That's an in-person event, right? It is, unfortunately. I'm sorry. <laughs> sure, um, well, not a ton, um, though I did trace both William Larned, um, the overseer of the poor, and Cuff Roberts, um, the, the veteran who was banished so frequently. I traced them both to where they were buried. Roberts was actually buried in Boston um, in a cemetery for, um, as it was called, a cemetery for colored people. Um, and I'm blanking on what the name of it was. Uh, I actually did walk up to it, but I couldn't get into it. I couldn't see his grave exactly. Um, and Larned uh, was buried at the Episcopal Church on North Main Street in Providence. 
so so for those two i i could trace them to their actual site of burial um but that's about as far as i i got so I want to attend an event on on burial grounds because I I have a lot more to learn about that. Mm, thank you for that answer. So, you know, throughout your research, you've mentioned that a lot of the times there's a little bit of leakage into Massachusetts or Connecticut or even Pennsylvania. Why did you decide to narrow it down to Rhode Island? Was there a specific reason or were you just pulled to this area? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And, and I, I think it's related to Nathan's too. Um, when I was dissert making, making a dissertation in the very early stages, I literally woke up one day, sat on my bed and thought, it's Rhode Island. Rhode Island is where I need to do my research um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, it had the, you know, an interesting ethnic diversity. It had a, a big slave trade and a, a considerable number of enslaved people. Um, and, uh, there were all sorts of reasons. And one of them, of course, is that it was within driving distance of where I was a graduate student. And that, that also helped. And, um, uh, and so ultimately, I found these five people. I didn't want to write a book that was my dissertation again. I wanted to write it in a very different way and tell the stories differently. But I had found these compelling people, and I wanted to tell their story um, and connect them together, as we talked about, as much as possible. Um, and Nathan asks, are, were things different um, in Southern colonies, um, in Virginia in particular? Uh, and these stories are from Rhode Island, absolutely. Um, and of course, you know, things are different everywhere, right? I, I mean, um, this is a local government story. These are local governments running the poor law and local governments are local. Like that's part of their appeal, right? That's part of their thing. Um, so there's always going to be some differences, but I actually think that there are way more similarities than differences. Um, even though uh, uh, poor laws were state laws um, after uh, independence, um, these state laws were very similar. They were all based on the Elizabethan poor law. And while states tinkered with them over time, I would say that the structure of every state's poor law, with the one exception of Louisiana, um, uh, because of the French influence, um, they were all the same essentially until the 1930s, until the Great Depression. So there are variations in how they're applied, in how, um, uh, and, and you know, the fact that slavery remains uh, a really big institution in Virginia throughout this period, that does change things a little bit. Um, but Virginia also has local poor relief institutions that, um, that, that work a lot like the ones in Rhode Island. Mm, I see that um, Matt made a comment here in the chat that said travel considerations are key. Um, so we have another comment here that says, what are your thoughts? What, are your, what is your thought process in the selecting your five cases? In other words, were there any other persons, people whose stories you almost included in your book? That's a great question, Sonia. Um, and the, the, the latest one was Cuff Roberts. It, it was only relatively late in writing the book that I thought, you know, I should really look into this, uh, this, this man's story a little bit more. Um, I wanted to give as many different angles on the poor law as possible, uh, from people who doled it out uh, to people who received it and received it in different ways, um, uh, you know, uh, in the poor house, not in the poor house. Um, and receive different kinds of poor relief. So I wanted to have different kinds of stories. And I think the five are quite different. Um, it was a bonus when they were connected to each other. Um, and, you know, you're right, there was someone I was going to include in the book. And I, and then I decided that this wasn't going to work. And I actually can't remember who they were. I, this is driving me crazy. But there, there were other people um, out there. Hmm. So it looks like we have another question here. Um, we're getting a bit closer to that 8 p.m. end mark. So I will have this as one of our final questions. And it says, was Rhode Island's poor relief character in this a function of a broad civic mindedness or a religious legacy of Puritan New England responsibility or something else? It's a great question, Tom. And I think it was both. Um, uh, it, was, um, it was by law required. I mean, I'm actually kind of amazed that the Elizabethan poor law and then the, the various American state poor laws, they actually guaranteed people from 
a locale, an unlimited right to uh, healthcare, to um, a home, uh, to food, uh, to firewood. Um, in theory, this was limitless. In practice, you know, they were super budget conscious and sometimes could be very um, parsimonious about it. Uh, but it was, you know, until the 1830s, in my view, it was uncontroversial. Uh, people assumed you had to do this uh, for people who were settled in your town while also warning out people from elsewhere. But for much of that time, I think people assumed that 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 everyone had somewhere that they were settled. Um, and, you know, while while Cuff Roberts was certainly discriminated against in Providence, in Coventry, he was um, he, he was accepted as a settled uh, a settled citizen. And so um, so I think there there is this like assumption that we need to be humane uh, and that this is our responsibility uh, 200 years ago. Mm. Well, that's a beautiful answer. Thank you for that. Um, I think the final question is just from me and the rest of the Rhode Island Historical Society. We wanted to take this moment to, first of all, thank you, and also just kind of roll out the red carpet for you with what you have coming up and where people can find your work. Are there certain links or websites people can go to if they want to further their research on what you do? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, I do have a web, a, a, a little website, uh, loyakinointhearchives.com. I think I can I can type that into the chat. Um, and that uh, includes my contact information and um, some of the other things that I've written. And, and uh, I would be happy to hear from you. And again, I'm so grateful for everyone who came and I appreciate you and um, I appreciate the Rhode Island Historical Society and happy 200th anniversary. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabriel, for being here with us. I think this night was great. You really enlightened all of us with your research and your information. Um, you know, big thank you to Sarah Carr, um, who's the Director of Advancement and Public Engagement here, who helped to make all this happen with this entire year-long series. And to our Executive Director, Morgan Grepp, thank you guys so much for helping to make these public access programs available so people can learn about, you know, these great topics. Um, and thank you all for being here tonight with us. And we hope to see you next month uh, with our next Inside the Archive series. And we also would love to see you all at our March 10th White Dog Distilling um, event with Tracy, who's here tonight. Hi, Tracy. Thank you for being here. Um, she'll be there talking about Snowtown. So thank you all so, so much. And we hope to hear from you all soon. And uh, have a good night, guys. And thank you so much, Gabriel. Hope thank to you. Good soon. night. Bye, everyone. Thank you bye so bye. much.